Welcome to another artist conversation in our series, Pathways for Dialogue, Past, Present, Future. Thank you, Linda, for that introduction, and thank you also uh, to Claudia for organizing all of these great events, uh, and to Jim Petrucci of the Petrucci Foundation for sponsoring this series of events. And this is, you know, this is our grand finale, so thank you all for coming uh, to hear from John Dow and Dara Haskins. <laughs> you will have seen John Dow's large white painting when you first came in. It was right uh, to that first gallery on your right. That was from his white series, To Move from Infinity. John was trained as a master printer at the Tamarind Lithography Workshop, and he taught at Temp Tyler Un School of Art at Temple University for the past several decades. He's now emeritus. A few highlights over his career include exhibiting at the 1970 Venice Biennale and running a lith lithographic workshop there, exhibiting at the 1975 Whitney Biennial, Performing, performing concerts using artwork for scores at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a performance at the Barnes Foundation last year, and a performance at the Kennedy Center, Center early this year. So please uh, help me welcome John Dow. <laughs> and Dara Haskins is also joining us. Uh, Dara Haskins, a uh, large piece you might have seen just right around the corner. In fact, you in the corner can probably uh, still see it. Uh, pr predominantly blue mixed media piece, Coconut Waters XXX. Uh, Dara is from Baltimore, Maryland, and currently lives and works in Philadelphia. She received her BFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where she was honored with several awards, including the Franklin C. Watkins Memorial Grant for Gifted Painters, as well as the J. Henry Scheidt Memorial Travel Scholarship. Since then, she has won the Mural Arts Fellowship for Black Artists in 2021, the Wind Fellowship earlier this year, and has also just received the 12 Gates Philadelphia Residency. So if you could welcome Dara Houston. <laughs> So th um, for, for those of you are, who are just getting to know uh, John's and Dara's works, I wonder if we should just start right with those uh, paintings that are in the exhibition tonight since as, as an introduction to, for our audience to your work. So could we each start by telling us a little bit about that particular piece, the ideas behind it, and the process for creating that? All right. OK, that goes back. That painting happened a minute ago. You know, <laughs> and uh, and all my work has been based on even further back than that. Uh, a sense about time. I'm very much interested in time, and uh, I had the the fortune to hang out with quite a few composers and musicians, and I was always in envious them. They had actual time, because someone could look at my work and leave but they had at least a movement, and then they would get up and leave, okay? <laughs> so, for, so I was perplexed about that, I couldn't deal with that. And finally, at one point, I went to graduate school in Seattle, and I'm from Philadelphia in Seattle, so they look at an Easterner, <coughs> you know what I mean? And so we went on this one picnic one time, and uh, <clears throat> we drove about two hours to the Olympic Peninsula and get out of the car, and I'm ready to sit down and eat. And they said, oh, no. What are you talking about? Oh, no. He says, we have to go over there. I said, there's nothing over there. And he said, well, that, see that little tree out there? That's where we're going. I said, that's about two hours away. He said, you're pretty good. <laughs> and, and then it hit me that I didn't have actual time, but I could make the viewer feel time by distance. And so that became the thing that got me really started and going so uh, about things. And I'm still, I was listening to a lot of music and stuff and a lot of various things from, and that's when I, I met John Cage and, and Maurice Cunningham and when I was in graduate school and stuff. And then later on, I met him a couple other times. And just one time, and forget that um, they had this new music concert and this guy came out in this magnificent tuck. I mean, it was magnificent. And he sat down at the tails, and he opened up the piano. 
and he puts his hand up there for 30 seconds, and then he closed the piano. I freaked out. I screamed. And said, like, my God, that's it. Structure is where you find it and where you organize it and can make it happen. And so those paintings, that white painting is a little bit about that thing about time. And it's about this thing about, I have this thing about infinity and distance, making it go, make it come from way, way, and bring you up forward, and movement and stuff and things. And, and it, it, it's about a dance piece, you know, that what's done. And I spent time with, with me, I, with, I spent a little time with Maurice Cunningham, and what was interesting to me was that he was interested in choreographing the space, not necessarily an event. He moved the events around and stuff in it. And that's what I hooked. That was my interest. So that helped me work my ideas and things to move in space and things like that. Well, that's yeah. enough for that. Right yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, I hope that gives you an idea. <laughs> well, tell us about coconut waters. How did you get to that point? Uh, well, I'm, I'm really inspired by time as well. But for me, it's more about space that you navigate. Um, actually, my first solo exhibition was called Navigating Space um, and I'm really inspired by dance and music and acrobats and just gesture and that conversation connected between time, space and the body. Um, so really I like to capture these figures in their natural state um, of their craft uh, and I think it's just so beautiful to be able to capture that. So yeah, really it's about like capturing these bodies in time, navigating space just as well. Yeah, and yeah. this is part of a, a larger series, the Taste mm -hmm. series, Taste right? Series, is yeah. that, do, your ideas that you were just describing, does that apply to the whole series or is this that just what yes, you're doing that one painting? Yes, it's that, but it's also about not just the body, but it's about those moments in memory where you can connect to things that are blissful to you things that you remember that, oh, I loved these olives, or I really enjoyed that glass of champagne, or I really enjoy these earrings that this person had on. So it's about these blissful moments that we want to remember. And is that, does that have a relationship to your use of um, rhinestones and other mixed media? Well, I like materials? shiny things. You like so. shiny things? <laughs> <laughs> I like shiny things, and I also want, like to explore different mediums of making. Going to PAFA, I learned traditionally oil painting and those rudimentaries, try to get out of the box to use different mediums. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, so Dara, you rely, not rely on, but you often work with the figure, with the body in, as a subject matter in your pieces. And John, you often, not always, but you often work with abstraction. And I'm wondering, although, you know, not always, and you of course have some abstraction elements in your work as well. So, yeah, and I'm wondering, like, if, if, like, how does working with the figure or working with the body help you to accomplish your goals? And how might abstraction help you to accomplish yours? Because some of your ideas that you just explained were overlapping, but your techniques are, or your methods are very different. Well, I feel like it helps me because it helps me challenge myself and seeing differently. Um, so I guess you could say that's how it helps me, Ch just challenging myself, working with artists, musicians. Um, I hear about this piano player that you're talking about for 30 seconds, like that for me would be a challenge to remember and be able to paint that. Yeah. Well, I couldn't paint, I just had to scream. <laughs> 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 it's been to that one, I, I didn't want to do that. But I, have, I did do, um, uh, I did a series of concerts. I did concerts from, oh, the mid 70s uh, to about 83, 84. And um, I got to the point where uh, I would hear what I want, you know, what I want played. And so I'd work with these group of musicians back and forth and stuff, doing different things and also uh, ideas about time became the intervals between 
uh, the notes and things became very important. But I did do a series of pieces where I, and I forget, I freaked out a bunch of musicians, and I had, I'm gonna say like, all right, I put this piece up, which is this drawing, a really intense drawing, and uh, I said, you got 30 seconds. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> and everybody had to bl bl out like that. <laughs> oh, man. So, but I mean, that, I mean, so I would go from intense things like that to real slow pieces where it's like really drawn out. Because how I did concerts was that I would project an image for the audience to see. Next to that image was another image, but it would be the detail. And so as we moved through the piece, the audience followed the score. So going through the whole thing, so I do that. So there are pieces that were, I don't know if it's one piece called The Long Swell, and it's one woman after she said, I thought it was never going to end. <laughs> But I mean, so I mean, I had that kind of range and stuff to me, and there was a certain kind of ideas about structure and like that. And you were saying like, how do I deal with you know abstraction and and, and stuff? Well, to me, when I'm putting things down, I'm always looking for some kind of way of structure. I got to order it. I got to figure out how it's going to happen and stuff like that, you know. But but later on, it became more or as important that I leave, I give the viewer enough QQs and they have to finish the piece. And that happened a lot with my cotton pieces, that I, it's there, but it's not, in some of my pieces, you can imagine seeing people, but there are no people there at all. You know, so that that's a sort of thing, and I refer back to that. And I, I'm, I, I'm working on my. I got involved in spirits, so I'm, I'm trying to do spirits all over Rittenhouse Square. You know, and telling people they're there, and people looking at me like I'm a little weird, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing this with many different mediums, like right. what you've just described: your Cotton series, some of your Rittenhouse right. series. They're photo-based some performative right. work as well. You've talked about music, composition, you've talked about drawing, painting, printmaking. So this breadth of medium that you're working in or have worked in, have you kind of, is this kind of a product of different stages of your career or have you always been interested in working with different mediums at the same time? Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing that you ask that because I've never decided to do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I was trained as a printmaker. I got my union card, you know, yeah. to teach because I, I taught printmaking because it's this place at Tamerly Lithographic Workshop. So I started doing that and then the interest in music came and I started dealing with that. And, and then at one point, um, uh, I, you know, I heard John Cage and stuff and Coltrane, but then I, I, I fell in love with uh, with Quincy Jones, when I did one album of Quintessence, they completely changed my color, the way I was putting color together. And so, and then I started doing some other things where I would shoot the photo, I would make a photograph, make a print, and then, um, and then I'd do some drawing over it, different stages to see, so I was, I was drawing the solo. And I said, Rio, this is crazy. I mean, this is the city, so why, why am I trying to draw a city? So I started photographing the city. And so that started to happen. And three or four years later, a curator said, he said, John, sit down and take a drink. You're going to need this. And it's like, you really should stop drawing. You should make, what's, what's wrong with my, what's wrong with my friends? You got to be out of your mind. And, you know, and he said, like, no, John, it's OK. But you shoot a little differently than a lot of people. You don't, aren't doing regular photographs and stuff. So, and gradually, it took three years more before, you know, I, because I don't listen to people telling me, you know, I got to do my own thing, you know. So, and so that's how the photography developed, you know, and that's, and it just moved one thing, moved into another, and, you know, and then I did another, I did a big exhibition. I said, I, I want to dance. So then the dance started moving into it. 
and the sound started moving into it. So, but I never said I was going to be a photographer. And I've never had a photographic class. I just annoy people, you know. And so, and, and we just gradually, I just gradually, I'm just sort of following it. I'm trying to find out, I'm 82, I'm trying to find out what am I going to, you know, who am I? And, you know what I mean? Who am I? And the thing is, like, and every now and then, Francis, you know, you, 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 you need to slow down a little bit. I said, but I'm 82, baby. I got to hurry. Oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> oh, and, and so, you know, I feel very blessed, very fortunate that I've been able to follow my head. And it just leads me, and it, it leads me to try to get more inside. That's, what, that's my goal, you know, is to get more inside. You know. and, you, and your focus is painting. I mean, you work primarily in painting, although you have mixed media elements in your works. But, you know, you and I were talking earlier, and your works are also kind of performative. You know, I mean, John is working with performance, but you've got a lot of performative elements, particularly in this last series, with the, the figures that you're working with, the activities that they're doing, the space that you're creating. Can you explain a little bit about, like, who these people are and what they're doing and how that affects well, you know, most your of them, compositions? They're, they're Philadelphia dancers, um, singers. I really enjoy gesture again. I feel like gesture, it can tell you so much about a person, and I just love to capture that. But, you know, I think that hearing you talk about your layers, I don't think I'm going to stay with just painting. I'm looking at short film. I'm looking at sculpture. Um, I'm not just giving myself one way to say one thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll explore those mediums as yes. they as they. We'll see. Arise. I'm still trying to figure it out too. Yeah. So yeah. Well, one thing that I think is really powerful about your painting is your color. You have very strong colors, and not just the blues that are electric, but you know some other vibrant oranges and reds and like really powerful color. Well, my color it came from Havana. I'm from Baltimore. There's color in Baltimore, but when I had a residency, I made a residency for myself in Havana after I graduated from PAFA. And I just took that time to immerse myself in color and culture and language and dance and spirituality and Santaria, learning about Orishas, Alegua, Ojon, you know, um, Yamaya, but all that kind of poured into my painting. Okay, and that's kind of the impetus behind that yeah. strength of color. Mm -hmm. Actually, my first, my first exhibition is called Havana Time, yeah. Because it's the time I spend. <laughs> 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 well, I think you were very fortunate because you probably you went to Havana in like 2019. Is that right? No. 2020. 20 yeah 2019 before yeah. the world exploded. Right. And time shifted. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, so. right when you hit the ground running with your career, mm -hmm. you know, you you got to do the Havana experience, and then when you got back, you know, you met with this major challenge of the painting. pandemic. Yeah. I just how did kept you, painting. How did I, you do that? How did you work through that? I started taking the color that I learned about and I reflected it on myself in this confined quarantine space. So really that just kind of overlapped into um, the, the people that being able to go out more and be connected to these other artists where we were so separated. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I mean, that's a, that's a major challenge to when you're starting a career to kind of have this huge uh, thing to, to navigate. And John, I'm sure you had, you know, the same kind of concerns for the pandemic and how to get through yeah, that. I mean, but you well, might have had other, no, you know. Yeah, I, mean, I was working with a group of people and I was doing my lights in Rittenhouse Square and, and I was, I gave lights that were blinking and stuff to like five or six people at different times. And, and I'd be 19 stories up talking to them on the phone and say, I'm gonna give you three. When I count three, you're to move. You move left, you move right. You know, you have 15 seconds. And that's when I started doing that. But then the pandemic hit, I, I wasn't gonna ask anybody to do it. And so then I started doing it by myself. Mm -hmm. And my studio started doing it. And she would look at me and say, what are you doing down here? Just going, <laughs> you know. But then, but also through the pandemic, we were, I mean, we would we'd put masks on and we would go shoot at least three nights a week. We'd go in Rittenhouse Square and shoot and stuff. It, a minimum of three nights a week that we'd shoot and stuff. And then, you know, uh, that's how we 
got back and forth, you know, with that, along with drinking wine, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got a question for you. Yes. Do you think that making during the pandemic, was it beneficial or was it not beneficial? Having the time to make by yourself and separate from other people. Well, it, it, was, it, it, was, it, was, it was beneficial for me in that, you know, I had, a, I had an idea and a practice and I had something I was looking for and, and I was fortunate I could do it. You know, I could, I could, I could put on a mask and we go out and we go to shoot and, but I had big lenses, so I didn't have to get that close to people in terms of shooting. So that, that's a separation. That was a whole kind of thing. And, and I was still after my idea, you know. At one point during the pandemic, to get these images that I used in that my public intimate spaces, I was doing nothing but shooting trees. I'd have to shoot a tree down here, a tree up here, up here, but at night. You know, and then I would shoot another one at night. And so there's all kinds of technical crap you got to go through to do that. And so, you know, during the pandemic, I could be anal and do all the crap that I had to do in order to get whatever sort of thing. And you had to be anal, otherwise it didn't happen, you know. And you work, you know, with people. Like there are figures in your paintings. Were you working previously from life with others in the room and the space? Myself. Okay, so you didn't have to... A lot of self-portraits. And it's so funny because now I have the time to work with other people, but now I'm reflecting back to portraits. Oh, okay. Interesting. Self-portrait. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So the next, when you talk about portrait, that's your, the next series you think will be I'm a portrait sure series? Yet. I'm still okay. figuring stuff out. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. I'm looking at flamingo right now. A lot of Indian gestures and a lot of traditional gestures about spirituality and connecting with others so yeah we'll see okay yeah. yeah well you know the three of us are from philadelphia at least we live and work and we're based there now but here we are in new york right and there are galleries next door and there are galleries across the street and all around the neighborhood um everywhere um and i'm wondering you know since you you've been in philadelphia long term you've got you know you went to school in philadelphia you're starting your career there what difference do you think, or how, and, and um, what do you think the effect of, is, of choosing your own town to work in? Like, you work in Philadelphia, you make that choice. Does that affect how your career unfolds, being in I, that place versus somewhere else? I think for me, it's, it's more effective because Baltimore has a lot of opportunities for artists more now. So me coming to Philadelphia for art school to learn my rudimentaries and to build kind of a community at the time that I did, I feel like there was more opportunities for me to learn and connect to a new community, giving me new opportunities and new, better spaces to grow. There's a lot of new galleries popping up in Philly now, you know, um, giving me more opportunities, I think, to have conversations with artists like John Dow and Didier Williams and Beresford Booth and, you know, just being able to connect differently than I would from where I'm from, where I started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, John? You've been in Philadelphia for, yeah, for a while. Yeah, I, I was, I've been here a minute and we, we you know, I, I went to graduate school in Seattle, Washington and I was on a grant in Los Angeles and stuff and then I came and I taught at Tyler, and uh, um, and then at one point when I was retiring, um, almost freaked Francis out. I says, "I think I'm going to go to Miami. You know, I, I, I'm I'm I might like having it warm and not cold. I don't like the cold. So I went back and forth with that, and then I thought about the work I was doing, how I was connected. You know." A lot of my stuff is technical based, so I work with assistants and different people back and forth. And I found that uh, that being here in Philadelphia gave me more access to what I needed to grow. And so uh, that became a, a, a strong thing for me, you know. So uh, yeah, and, and we, we could work and 
you know, and we have an apartment here, so I'm here when I need to be here in New York. And, um, but I keep it down so I can really work because, you know, we could spend the time just driving back and forth. You know, it's a couple of weeks we're doing things like, my man, we're up and down every other day. Say, well, you know, I mean, we don't have to do that because we got the apartment. So, you know, I'm and then I'm working with my sister on the phone. He's doing this and doing that. And I said, I'll pee. I said, enough is enough, baby. Bye. I'm going home. <laughs> You know, so, uh, but, 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 but God has been good to us. I mean, when they say, hey, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm able to do, I'm able to do and to grow and to be very appreciative of people around me, you know, and be helpful when I can. And I think that, I think that's, I think that's the important thing, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that community, you know, that you're both describing is a very strong community in Philadelphia and to have that home base, whether or not you're traveling to New York or, you know, flying to Detroit or wherever your art practice takes you, having that home base that's so strong is important. Community is key. It's something that I've learned. First thing that I learned out of, out of graduating is that most of the work that I do is outside of the studio so that I can learn more inside of the studio. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you spend um, a lot of time observing. Yeah, out in, out in the in the yeah. world in different spaces. Yeah, and that it makes more sense to me because navigating space outside teaches. I'm teaching myself my own lessons. Mm -hmm. So, and it gives me more space to explore in my paintings. I don't know. I have conversations with myself when I'm working. So, <laughs> not <laughs> allowed <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> oh, sometimes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> sometimes yes. allowed. Yeah. Like, oh, did yes. I just talk to myself aloud? And I'm the oh, only yes. one in here. <laughs> no, but, but, but I have an assistant. He says, You're talking again, John. <laughs> You're talking again. So it's again. not just me. Okay. <laughs> that makes me feel so much more better. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, the two of you were not paired on this panel by accident. We have, you know, Dara as, a, as an emerging artist, kind of at the, near the beginning of her career, you've really hit the ground running. Um, you've got a great, you know, potential, all sorts of things happening right now. Uh, and then, John, you have so much experience that over the last, you know, few decades that you've experienced lots of different kinds of changes in the art world and different changes in your own practice. Do you have any, this is a double question, what kind of words of wisdom do you have to Dara, who is kind of getting started? And Dara, what kind of questions do you have for John as uh, you know, an established artist? I don't really have any questions right now. I don't know, I don't. Do you ever feel yourself like not being, do you feel like there's a bar for an artist like me these days, that there's an expectation to be a specific amount of success? Uh, if you feel that, ignore it. <laughs> Absolutely ignore it. Uh, the thing I, what I would like to encourage you is to get into connecting more with what is important for you and to hear less of what's around you. Because in the long run, you are your wonderful, unique person. And what you want to ask God to do is to help you bring that out and discover that and what it can be about. All this other stuff is trends, the business, money, politics, and all kinds of stuff, which has, I feel, very little to do with you. And I think the more you can touch that, ooh, you're going to be dangerous. <laughs> Thank you. Well, what questions does the audience have for John and Dara? Well, um, I guess my question to each of you is just as um, a writer looks at the blank page 
and can be a little bit panicked or petrified about what they want to say or how they go about saying it. What kind of experience does the artist have that may or may not be similar? And when do you know your piece is finished? Ooh. I want to let you answer that. Please. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, right now I have an assignment at my studio given to me my, by my critic. Actually, I'm exhibiting right next to him. His name is Didier Williams. He got on me because he asked me the same question, when do you know you're done? And I started overthinking, and he said, um, you're overanalyzing. You know it's done when you know it's done. That's that. It comes from your spirit. You don't have to answer anybody else's questions. What your first thought is, is your last thought. When it's done, it's done. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, um, I, I have, I've had some pieces that, I mean, extended pieces that put together and, for example, I have a 16 foot, you know, uh, photograph I did, it's called The Night Before the Run. Mm -hmm. And it, it came from a dream. And um, I was putting it together and putting it together. And at one point, um, my assistant said, are, are we done? I said, well, give me a minute. I said, yep, it's done. He said, why are you doing that? Because it did it, it did it, it did it. And then I'm working on another piece now, which is crazy. I'm working on a piece that's 10 by 65 feet. And um, I think it's done. But what happens to me is I get a feeling. I, I get a feeling and it talks and I'm trying more and more to communicate with myself. Mm -hmm. My grandmother talks a lot to me and stuff and I've been I'm becoming more and more spiritual. I pray more than I ever have in my life which shocked her, you know. Uh, but it's it, it, it's become very important to me that you know I'm 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 touching base with something and that that sort of gives me a certain kind of confidence. It's not like, you know, I, and, and, and I'm a technician, you know, this is bounced, that's bounced, this, this, the light's got to do, like I'm a nut, that kind of way. But it, it goes beyond that, it's something else in it. And it's that, and that, it's that inner feeling, that inner spirit, and that's what I'm driving for. Mm -hmm. I feel that, um, to touch on that a little bit more, I always ask myself a question like, did your feeling feel complete? Not just the thought. Um, if it, the feeling feels more complete, then it's done. Sometimes the thought gets there before the feeling and I don't touch it because it's not finished having conversation with myself. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Sometimes I talk and I'm like, did, did I just have a, was that a poem? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it hard to get started sometimes? Like you're talking about, you know, if you have an idea, then that motivates you to get started. You know that you were thinking about spirituality and your grandmother. Is, your, is it hard sometimes to have a canvas in front of you and, and actually make that first mark? You always know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I sit with it for a while. Sometimes it takes me a while to just, I just go, you know. Um, right now I'm trying to start this practice where I don't draw before I paint. I just paint. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like I'm trying to over, over explain something that's already within me. I'm curious about throughout your own journeys, what's been your experience articulating yourself to the world in relation to your own work? Like is, you create work that then is presented publicly in different ways, it's defined by other folks that maybe, you know, critics or others that engage with it. But what's been your experience so far in, and maybe over time, figuring out how do you explain yourself and what you're trying to do to the world and I guess, yeah, what's the evolution of that for you? It's a big question. Um, 
sometimes they've been nice, and sometimes they have not been nice, and sometimes they haven't even looked, and it's being gauged by these other forces and not my work. And so uh, that's what I have to separate. I have to stay, my thing is to stay with the work. Now, I'm not like, I mean, I know some artist friends of mine who can sit down and, and you ask them a question and, you know, 30 pages later, they still talking. <laughs> you know, and um, I, I'm not that way. I, I, um, I think about it and stuff, and it's a lot. Of, it's in my head a lot, and and um, I I do some reading, but mostly I you know I do a lot of listening. I do a lot of listening, you know what I mean. And then I get, you know, like we're in the car going someplace, and and Archie Shepard's got a version of Attica Blues on. I'm going. She says, "You played that thing five times." When they says, "But I got a color coming. I got a color coming." <laughs> <laughs> I got a way to put that color together a certain kind of way, you know, and that works. And then somebody walks up to me and say, like, well, what this is about? And I says, Shep, it's Attica Blues on a certain thing, you know what I mean? And, 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 and it blues for Brother George, you know what I mean? And back and forth. And there's a certain kind of tension and things about that that happen that is about feeling. And a lot of times I can't. I try, but I can't get that thing across. So uh, sometimes I worry about it. I mean, if somebody really means something to me, they really talk, I'll try to talk through it, mm. you know? And I got a couple friends around who, who listen to me once or twice a week, and they say, and they say I'm like, they're like my psychiatrist in a way, you know what I mean? And, but, but, but I'm doing my thing, you know? So, and so that, that's important. And in the long run, I just see like, Hey, the work is on the wall. You can go with it or you can't go with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's my best thing. If you want some clues, sometimes I can give you some clues. But as far as I'm concerned, that's unimportant. The important is that if you take a minute. And I had a show not long ago, and I told these people, I said, if you come to see this show, you have to spend time. You don't spend time, you aren't going to get it. That's all. I feel the same way. Sometimes people ask me, what does this mean? And I'm like, what does it mean to you? I don't know what you, I already did the work. I already had the conversation with myself. Sometimes those questions get exhausting. But for me, I feel like as a black queer painter, I, people try to put me in this box to explain myself that way. And I said what I said, you know, it's already been said. So I feel like that's, that's up to you, yeah. Yeah, and it's not your job to justify yourself, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that does leave a lot of space for the viewer, you know, for the, the exhibition goer, for the, you know, the um, kind of uninitiated, you know, we don't know what you're doing, but we're learning, you know, so. I, I like to be able to have that space to be a person who can respond. <laughs> yeah. Good. Other other questions? I'm now choosing. I, I'm <laughs> I'm trying to decide which question I want to ask, um, but I'm going to go the technical route because when I think of both of your practices, another distinction that comes to mind is that Dara, you're this more. I think. When you approach painting, it's loose, it's gestural, and John, you described yourself as a technician, and your approach is slower and, and meticulous in the way that I understand it. How did you arrive at this point in your practice? Do you ever challenge yourself to, to, do the, to create differently? And um, you know, does it yield a more interesting result, or does it feel less authentic if, dare you got fixated in the details, or what might feel like minutia, or John, you felt like you had to loosen yourself a little bit? Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, you know, all I'm saying is that, you know, I've been, I've been at it for over 60 years, so I slide in and out. You know, I think it's like when I was doing music and stuff, and I was doing watercolors, a certain kind of flow and stuff like that, and then and I went on to, because those white paintings go over, over 20 years, 
and they tightened up and loosened up in different kinds of space, but they got involved in all kinds of things like, you know, about spirits and, you know, about the afterlife and stuff like that. And, you know, I did a lot of research, some research with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who uh, she's a, a, a psychologist who interviewed people who were technically dead. And to me, that's the ultimate time. And so, and she interviewed a tremendous number of them. They talked about going down channels and seeing their relatives and spirits and stuff. And I was concerned about transparent space and stuff, so I ended up doing paintings based on that and stuff. And then, and, and, and then I got, you know, of course, I stumbled, of course, Robert Ferris Thompson. And we were, you know, and I'm talking to him one day, I said, I'm showing him my, some drawings of mine. And he says, John, they're just African spirit drawings. I don't know what you're talking about music. I'm gonna go, duh. <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, I, I don't know, things lead to other things and interests, and I'm just being hoping enough that I follow the interest in where it goes, and that's, so I mean, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to do all of those things that I wanted to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people say, well, you can't do that. You can't do a concert using your artwork of scores, you know? But I did it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and you can't do things like that. I, I sort of, I eliminate that thing. It's just like you have an idea, you have an impulse, and you know, where is it gonna lead? And hopefully, you know, I can follow it and be honest enough with it to give someone a feeling or a touch about it. That's the goal, you know, and, um, yeah. Well, I feel like you are you just you just said it. You just I feel that I feel that too. I feel as though I still have a lot more to learn, a lot more to see. I kind of just also follow that pathway um to understand myself more. And the more I understand myself, the more the work will grow. Um, the more I understand my ancestry, the more the work will grow. I don't feel like I need to hurry up either. Like when people tell me to hurry up, I slow down. If I don't want to, you know. Um, so I take the time that I need to learn and grow as an emerging artist just to see where that conversation leads me and where it's gonna take me, which I know in my heart, it's gonna go up very far. Yeah, and that's what makes it authentic, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No? Okay, great. Well, thank okay. you, both of you, and thank you all for coming. And on behalf of the foundation, I can say it's just been a fantastic ride we've all had through these last many, many conversations. And this is such a great finale to have these two talented people be so generous to share these thoughts, feelings with us, it's, it's a gift. And thank you, Susanna, again. One more hand for this wonderful crowd.